Hey, what is up, everybody, and welcome to the College Info Geek Podcast. My name is Thomas Frank, and this is a show that helps you become a more effective student. Now, one of the things I get asked about quite a lot is sleep, and I've done a couple of videos on my YouTube channel about sleep. I did one about how to get to bed on time and how to establish a regular bedtime schedule, and also one on how to wake up early, and I've been wanting to make a video for quite a while on how to improve the quality of your sleep while you're actually comatose in bed. And I'm gonna do that video soon, which is why I'm really excited about today's episode because today my guest on the show is an actual sleep doctor and we are gonna talk a lot about the science behind how to get better sleep. So his name is Dr. Michael Bruce. He is a clinical psychologist and he's a diplomat on the American Board of Sleep Medicine. He is a sleep doctor and he has a new book out tomorrow, actually, called The Power of When, which is all about chronotypes. Now, what is a chronotype? A chronotype is basically your body's default sleep schedule. Some people are sort of programmed to go to bed later and to wake up later. Some people are programmed to go to bed earlier and to wake up earlier, which is me. And your chronotype defines not only what time you should go to bed and wake up for optimal results, optimal energy, optimal learning performance, etc. But it also determines the times at which you should do other things like learn, like do physical activity, etc. And uh, his book is all about this. Now, Dr. Bruce, through all of his studies and his work with clients, he's defined four different types of chronotype groupings. And if you want to figure out what yours is, which is going to help you to figure out when you should do things most optimally, he's created a quiz that you can take, which will put you into one of those four categories. And you can take that quiz over at thepowerofwhenquiz.com. And it has a the in there. So thepowerofwhenquiz.com. It's like a 45 second quiz. And I actually went through the quiz before I recorded this episode with him. So I know what my categorization is. And it may be helpful for you to go through the quiz before you listen to this episode. But if you don't have time to, if you're driving or if you're fighting off ninjas or something, that's totally cool. I think you're going to get a lot out of the episode anyway. So in this episode, we will go through what a chronotype is, when you should do specific things based on your chronotype. But we're also going to talk a lot about the science of how to get better sleep. Because if I I've got a sleep doctor on my podcast. I'm going to ask him questions beyond just the chronotype stuff. So we're going to talk about a lot of other sleep related topics, and I definitely think you're going to find this episode helpful. So hopefully you enjoy it. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, you can find them over at CIGpodcast.com. That'll take you over to the main podcast page on College Info Geek, where you can find the episode 124 link. And there you'll find lots of resource links. You'll find a link to buy his book if you want. You'll also find a link to that quiz if you just can't be bothered to type Type it in yourself, and you'll also find links to rate and review the podcast on iTunes if you want to be awesome. Speaking of awesome, a couple of weeks ago, Martin and I mentioned that we have a brand new College Info Geek t-shirt over on DFTBA.com, which stands for Don't Forget to Be Awesome. See, nice segue there, right? And at that time, the shirt was on pre-order, so if you would have ordered it back then, you would have had to wait a few weeks to get it. But now, I am literally wearing the shirt. It is freaking awesome. And if you want to get the College Info Geek shirt and actually get it delivered in a timely manner, you can now do so. So if you want to do that, you can go to collegeinfogeek.com slash shirt. That'll take you over to dftba.com where you can get the shirt in your size, even if your size happens to be extra small. I did negotiate with them to make sure that was available. So if you want to get a shirt, definitely do that. Otherwise, enjoy this interview with Dr. Michael Bruce. Dr. Bruce, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. Glad to be talking to you. So I was really excited to have you on the show when I got the email from your assistant because I get a ton of questions about sleep. Like you would <laughs> not believe. And uh, I, I did a couple of videos about sleep a while ago. I did one about when to go to bed and one about how to wake up early. And I have mm -hmm. not yet gotten my other sleep related videos out. People keep asking me questions. And I, I, th I thought, hey, talking to a sleep doctor would be the coolest thing ever. So... I have many wow. different questions I, for you. That, that's quite a that's quite a reputation to live up to. The coolest thing ever. I don't know if I'm going to make it there, but I'm I'm going to give it my best. Well, that is now the standard you must live up to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I'll probably mention this in, in the intro, but you've got a book coming out called The Power of When. It will be out tomorrow, as of people first listening to this, and it is all about chronotypes and the best types that are times of the day to do things. Yeah. So I just took this quiz you have. Mm -hmm. which categorized me as a lion. And you said that was good. 
Yeah. Which makes me feel good. But I'm curious. So what is uh, what is a lion and what are the categories for sure. different, I guess, chronotypes? Yeah. So I'm going to I want to back up just for a quick second and explain to everybody what a chronotype is, okay. because a lot of people haven't heard of that word before, but you actually already know what it is. So if you ever heard of somebody being an early bird or a night owl, those are actually chronotypes. And um, I've been an actively practicing sleep specialist for the last 16 years. And um, about three or four years ago, I started noticing that some of the techniques that I worked for in, on insomnia, which is my specialty, weren't working so well. And I couldn't quite figure out why. And so I started to really ask my patients some more because the techniques that I was using usually work very well. I, I try to stay on the non-pharmaceutical side. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with sleeping medication during very particular times, like to break the cycle of insomnia or if somebody's got major depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, something like that, that can actually be a, a big help to them. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think most people can actually fall asleep without medication and that's always been my preference. So I, I was been using some very specific techniques with people and they weren't working all that well. And so when I interviewed my patients, I said, well, tell me a little bit more about what's going on. And, and one of the things that kept coming through was they said, I can fall asleep just fine and I can stay asleep just fine. It's that I sleep at the wrong times. Mm. And I was like, what? What do you mean you sleep at the wrong times? And he said, yeah, I sleep at the wrong times. And I'm like, okay, let's figure this one out. And um, so we started looking around and so I said, well, why don't we do this? Let me talk to your boss, let me talk to your family and let's see if we can educate them a little bit more about you because this person was more of a night owl, what I call a wolf. And I'm a wolf, by the way, so I could definitely relate. And so we educated her boss, we educated her family and I said, look, can she just come into work two hours later and work two hours later? And she was like, yeah, it's fine. So lo and behold, we run the experiment, we run it for a week and her boss was like, you know what? She's more productive. She's easy. She gets in, you know, she's here on time. I'm not having to worry about her coming to meetings. This is fantastic. And her family members were like, yeah, she's not crabby. You know, she, we get, everybody gets along with her better. If we just let her sleep in the morning and she gets her sleep, she's in great shape. And so it started to make me think through the idea about chronotypes. When I did a literature search, trying to understand more about it, primarily what I had ever learned in my, in my studies had been that there are early birds and night owls, but mm -hmm. those only make up about you know, 25 to 30 percent of the population, about 15 percent early and about 15 percent late. There's a whole lot of the population that wasn't accounted for. So decided to make my own type of assessment to be able to kind of look at with my patients, which type are you? So I could kind of know and understand a little bit more about what was going on. So lions, which is what you are, are my early birds. OK, but. I learned a lot about them because in fact, there's a lot of personality characteristics to lions that a lot of people don't know and understand just based on their sleep schedule. So my lions are my leaders. These are the people who are my COOs of a company. They're very good managers. They like to go from A to B to C to D. They're not interested in variating, you know, a whole lot. They, they kind of like, they're like my get it done kind of people. And they're highly intelligent. They're up early and they like to do things early. They also have a tendency to not be as socially inclined because they're tired by 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night. And so a lot of times dinner and a movie for them are not something that they can participate in. Dinner, sure. Mm -hmm. But the movie, they're asleep at the, you know, by the end of the movie, unless it's like some crazy <laughs> action movie or whatever. That um, is me, 100%. Oh, see, so there we go. Yep. When we look at some of the other chronotypes, it gets really interesting. So as an example, one of the chronotypes, the next chronotype that's kind of in the 24 hour cycle is a bear. So my bears are my extroverted, enjoyable, laughable, in, you know, fun kind of people. These are the people when you sit down with them at lunch, they're always telling a funny story about what's going on at home or what's going on at work or something like that. They're kind of the glue that keeps society together. They, they do their work, but they also like to play. Mm -hmm. um, they're not just career oriented or career motivated. They love to have a good time and, and they think it's just as important as having a good career. And they have a tendency to get up at a fairly normal time, 7.30, go to bed at a fairly normal time, 10.30. Okay. My wolves, which is what I am, are the night owls. So we are we have a tendency to be a little bit more introverted. We're super creative. Most of my wolves are musicians or artists or writers or actors or people like that. They're people who love to stay up late and they love to sleep late. They're not going to be the first person to show up at the party. They're usually not going to show up until 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And they're going to kind of scope things out and decide if they like you. If they like you, they will be very talkative. But if they're not interested in talking to you, you're not going to get a word out of them edgewise. 
Hmm. And and so those three chronotypes made up a large part of society, but my patients still weren't represented by those three. And mm-hmm. so I chose dolphin to represent them. And the reason I chose a dolphin is because most people don't know it, but dolphins sleep unihemispherically, meaning half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. And I thought that was this cool kind of metaphoric representation of my patients who never quite get a good night's sleep because that's what my dolphins are. These are my type A personalities, but they're also a little obsessive compulsive and sometimes to the point where they don't actually get stuff done that they want to get done. Mm -hmm. They are highly educated. They usually are the people who are coming into my office saying, I need my eight hours and I'm not getting my eight hours and why aren't I getting my eight hours? And they're, you know, very regimented in their kind of thought process. Yeah. And, and they're very interesting people to work with. But once I kind of figured out the four categories, my next step was, hmm, I wonder what would happen, you know, cause I kind of ran that experiment with my one patient. I wonder what would happen with other activities that people do during the day. And could I find specific times of day where each chronotype would function better at each activity? Mm-hmm. And if you just look in the literature, you can match up hormone levels and it makes a lot of sense. So one of the areas that people always ask me about is sex, because one of the topics in my book is when is the best time to have sex? Mm-hmm. And so if you look at it, it's pretty interesting. So I'm not sure who decided for the idea of when uh, that people should be having sex at night, because from a hormonal standpoint, you couldn't pick a worse time. Your testosterone is low, estrogen is low, progesterone is low, cortisol is low, and your melatonin is high. Yeah. Like that's not a recipe for having sex. <laughs> that's a recipe for going to bed. <laughs> right. Yeah. But yet, 73% of people when surveyed say that the reason that they have sex is purely based out of convenience. You know, that person is mm-hmm. lying next to you. You're not wearing as many clothes. It's dark. It's the end of the day. You kind of look over. Hey, you interested? Yeah, sure. Why not? Boom. There you go. It's really not based on desire. It's really not based on timing when it could be. Quite frankly, one of the best times for people to have sex is in the morning. But, you know, if you're a later morning person like a wolf, then you don't want to have it at eight o'clock in the morning. You want to have it more at 10 o'clock in mm-hmm. the morning. Now, obviously, that doesn't always work out for people if they have families or kids or commitments in the mornings or things like that. So I also I created a matrix. Right. So just because you're a particular chronotype doesn't necessarily mean that your partner is the same chronotype. Yeah. So I created this matrix where you can look up your chronotype and look up your partner's chronotype. And I give you one evening time and one morning time that you guys should, you know, give it a shot and see what happens. And you might be surprised at how, how well your performance is, how much more connected that you feel, things like that. Is this in the book or is this on the, the site? It's in the book. Okay. That's cool. Cause yeah, my girlfriend I know is a very, very different chronotype than me. For mm-hmm. one, she needs about one and a half to two hours more sleep than me. Sure. At least. Yep. And, um, she's also, I think she likes to get up a lot later and Mm -hmm. she would rather go to bed later if possible. So, right. So she's more of a night owl and you're more of an early bird, right? Mm -hmm. So in my vernacular, you're a lion and she's a wolf and Mm -hmm. that's a very, very common situation. And so, you know, you've got to kind of figure that one out. Like, well, when are we going to be able to do this? When are we going to be able to have a conversation or sex or go out to dinner? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's one of these things that you don't think about it. Like I wish (laughs) match.com, you know, (laughs) do chronotypes because you would find out lot about the person way ahead of time and it could be it could be pretty interesting yeah that's interesting and i feel fortunate that i don't need as much sleep as she does because it means i can go to bed around the same time that she goes to bed and still get up at you know 6 6 30 and then she can sleep much 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 later if she wants to (laughs) so what causes these different chronotypes is there a specific gene or a specific there is okay it turns out that there's the per3 gene and the per2 gene dramatically affect your chronotype or your internal circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. And so it also affects your sleep drive. So the amount of drive that you have behind your level of sleep. So kind of it's, you know, sleep drive is a lot like hunger. So, you know, you get hungry, you get hungry, you get hungry, you eat something and that hunger dissipates. The same holds true with sleep is that sleep drive has a tendency to build throughout the day. We know from a neurochemical standpoint, it's actually the buildup of something called adenosine, mm-hmm. which is a cellular byproduct that builds up in your brain. Oddly enough, this is kind of like a weird factoid. If you look at the molecular structure of adenosine and you look at the molecular structure of caffeine, mm-hmm. they're off by one molecule. Yeah. And I read somewhere that caffeine molecules will basically fit into the adenosine slots exactly. and then block adenosine from being recepted for a certain period of time. And that's why you get that boost. Exactly. But then you lose 
or is it yeah i think you lose well, adenosine receptors or something like that yeah well there's two things that can happen number one is once you burn through that caffeine the adenosine comes flooding in mm -hmm. and you that's where you, why you get that caffeine crash but number two over the course of time those adenosine receptor sites can, will actually potentially can change into caffeine receptor sites and then you start to lose that ability which is problematic oh and then people need their caffeine right okay that makes sense mm -hmm. so i think you know a lot of people might be driving or on a run or juggling or something right now but uh <laughs> you had me take this quiz and i feel like maybe if people stop and take the quiz before they listen to the rest of it it might be good so mm -hmm. uh, i'll just tell people where to go right now you can go to the power of when quiz.com and figure out what yours is and uh, yep. maybe you'll be a lion like me maybe you won't be yeah and it's completely free and you'll get a yeah. full report you know like there's a video where i describe to you all the different things about you and there's a full report there it doesn't cost a dime mm -hmm. um but my goal here is to get as many people as i can to take the quiz because i want people to start understanding their chronotypes because you may find that you have communication with somebody that's of a different chronotype and it might be advantageous for you to be able to understand more about them whether yeah. it's you know a relationship a loved one a boss an employer employee what have you um, teacher who knows knowing and understanding your chronotype and when you will be at your best is certainly going to be helpful to you in the long run now i i mostly agree that i'm a lion Mm -hmm. And I love to be up early in the morning and specifically it is it is less that I love to wake up super early and more that I just feel very bad about myself if I wake up late. <laughs> but I also can find semi rare times where I will stay up really late if I have a project I'm working on and I work incredibly well really late at night. So this is actually one of my biggest struggles and I, I almost like resent the fact that I have to sleep because I can mm. work very well at night but then I don't like to sleep in later. Do you have people right. who are also like that where they just can't really figure out what their chronotype is? Well, I have a lot of people, well, once they meet me, they figure out what their chronotype is because mm. I teach them. But there's a lot of people out there who don't even, have not even been introduced to this idea. And once I introduce the idea to them, they're like, oh my gosh, this makes so much more sense now. Like I was, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine and he said to me, he said, I've always felt guilty because he's a single guy, attractive, nice fella. And he's, he was looking to go out on a, on a date and meet somebody nice. And he found himself yawning by eight 30 on the date. And he was like, mm. I'm not, you're not boring me whatsoever. I, I'm just, this is who I am. I, I'm, I'm not a, a night kind of person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once they explained that to that person, they were like, Oh, you know what? I'm really not either. When you, when you said we were going to do this date at seven, I really wanted it to be at five 30, but I didn't think I should ask. And so all of a sudden it just opens up this really cool line of communication. So once people kind of get comfortable with their chronotype and they start asking other people, it's pretty interesting to see number one, who are the, what are the chronotypes of the people around you? But number two, how your communication style will change. Yeah. So one thing I learned recently kind of about chronotypes is that that sleep drive that builds throughout the day actually peaks at two different times during the day. Mm -hmm. Like I think it was like 2 to 4 a.m. and then also like 1 to 3 p.m. And a lot of people yes. get really tired after lunch. And I find that basically once 1 or 2 p.m. hits, my creativity is shot for the day. Yeah. And that's actually super characteristic of lions between one and three is not your on or alert time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two reasons for that. One is most people don't know, but there is actually a core body temperature dip that occurs between one and two in the afternoon. And that slight dip in core body temperature is actually a signal to the brain to release melatonin. Really? Um, okay. Uh huh. And so, and we've been seeing this for thousands of years in Latin American countries because they have what's there called a siesta, mm -hmm. right? And so siestas occur based on the biological functionality of a core body temperature drop and that uh, small amount of melatonin kind of eking out and affecting the brain. The other is, is that adenosine has been building up throughout the day. So you've got adenosine on board and now you've got a little bit of extra melatonin and the brain is like, yahoo, let's go to sleep because you're getting super groggy at that point in time. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is if you look at the, the, I have a whole chapter on brainstorming, like when can you get most creative? It, believe it or not, the times that people have a tendency to get most creative is when they're distracted or when they're sleepy. Re um, okay. Right. Because, that, yeah. Right. Because you're not functioning with all gears. Your mind is kind of wandering. You're kind of a little bit in a daze. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. The other time that people have a tendency to be most creative is literally moments after they wake up in the morning. 
So you ever wake up in the morning and find and figure out, oh my gosh, I've got a great idea. I've got to run and write that thing down because I want to you know, do this or that or the other. That's because right before you wake up, you're usually in REM sleep. And REM sleep is the sleep where you move information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Mm -hmm. And you kind of create that organizational structure, which is good for retrieval, but it's also great for solving problems. And so a lot of people wake up with being very creative and then somewhere between one and three in the afternoon, they get pretty creative as well. That's interesting. And it kind of makes sense. I've been I've been uh, learning about basically how the brain has two modes of work, like focused work and more of a a diffused mode where you're not really concentrating so much power on prefrontal cortex and regimented thought. So it kind of makes sense that a little bit more tired part of the day would mm -hmm. benefit that. Absolutely. So what do I do during <laughs> my afternoon slump? Because napping does not work for me. If I nap, guaranteed it will be at least two hours of my day wasted and I still yeah. will wake up incredibly groggy. Yeah. So first of all, you're napping way too long. And so if you wanted to nap during that period of time, I would recommend a 25 minute nap or a 90 minute nap, 90 minute being roughly a full sleep cycle, 25 minute where you'd get rid of enough stage one and stage two sleep and enough adenosine would get eaten up that you'd probably feel more alert and be able to kind of a power nap, be able to push on. But the easiest thing to do is go outside and get sunlight. So okay. melatonin is called the vampire hormone. And the reason it is, is because it does not function well in sunlight. As a matter of fact, the melatonin faucet in your brain literally turns off with the presence of sunshine. Um, really? Specifically, okay. yeah, specifically blue light, which is 460 nanometers. So believe it or not, that's the same light that you see on your cell phone mm -hmm. or on your laptop or on your tablet. And so that's one of the reasons why people are really worried about using blue light in the evenings because it does have an effect on the brain. Yeah. But if you want, if you're getting slow between one and three, the best thing to do is walk outside and for 15 minutes, walk around in the sunlight. If you can, don't wear sunglasses. Um, it's only 15 minutes. It's not going to do any major damage to you or anything like that. But getting those sun rays in will stop that melatonin. And then the walking will help you from a cardiovascular standpoint, move the, move your blood around and get things going again. You know, we're now starting to think that sit, sitting is almost as bad as smoking was a while back. Oh, cool. Well, I'm, I'm standing right now. So that makes me feel good. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I, so my solution for this has always been to go exercise in some way, but I didn't mm -hmm. know about the sun thing, but for yeah, me, it's always been, key. okay. And you know what? That makes sense. Cause I usually, usually what I'll do is I'll just go for a walk and that seems to help. And even yeah, the, perfect. the 25 minute nap thing for me, it just doesn't seem to work because I will literally set my timer for 25 minutes, give or take five to actually fall asleep. But I just wake up so groggy that I will go snooze the the phone. Uh, <laughs> and it's like more powerful snooze drive than I have when I'm sleeping. So I've just learned right. to avoid naps altogether. Well, and lions aren't are lions aren't the best nappers mm -hmm. in the world. Dolphins should never nap. Okay. Um, I tell people this all the time because they're not great sleepers to begin with. So them napping is really not a good idea whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but uh, some of my lions are not really the best nappers because they're much better off if I just keep them awake and keep them productive. And then from there, we kind of move move to the scenario of getting that sunlight, getting a little exercise, waking them up, and then they can go to bed at a reasonable time and they're in great shape. Cool. So do each of these chronotypes kind of sync up to a number of hours they need for sleep or is, is the hours of sleep people need more tied to their age? How does that function? So it's interesting. The quality of your sleep seems to change with age because we know that when people hit the 50, 55 age range, melatonin production begins to slow down. Okay. So, and melatonin, while it's not the only thing that you need for sleep, it's really the key that starts the engine for sleep. And so one of the things that we're constantly trying to do is understand this paradigm of how much sleep do you need? What kind of sleep do you need? Things like that. So as we age, our sleep needs may change a little bit. But generally speaking, the amount of sleep that we need is roughly the same, assuming you're, you're getting roughly the same quantity. I mean, rather quality of sleep. So it's not being affected by things like alcohol or caffeine or things like that. Mm -hmm. So as you age, it's basically that same. I've usually told people usually between like the seven and nine hour range for at least our age range is what I've seen. Mm -hmm. So I usually say, yeah. you know, seven and a half hours is that nice five different 90 minute sleep cycle sweet spot. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
So apparently it doesn't change with age as long as you can keep the melatonin production up. That's interesting. Exactly. And so that's why some of my patients who are older, I am using melatonin supplementation mm -hmm. because it makes sense because there's a deficit. You know, for my younger patients, though, it's rare that they're actually going to require melatonin. So that makes me curious. Do you think that the slowdown of melatonin secretion as or its production as you're getting older has anything to do with maybe just becoming more sedentary or is it actually an aging process thing? I think it's both. Okay. I think that what ends up happening is, is when you're more sedentary, you take more unscheduled naps, right? You're watching the mm. ball game, you fall asleep, it's the third inning, you fall asleep, it's the sixth inning, and you didn't really, you know, sleep sleep, but you've, you've reduced the amount of adenosine in your system so much so that it makes it more difficult to sleep later. And then there's the melatonin deficiency that can happen as well. Yeah. So I've heard that when you're trying to establish a sleep schedule, it's really, really important to have it be the same every single day. Is that true? It's really important. Yeah. So if every, if anybody takes one thing away from, from this podcast, other than go get your chronotype and figure out what it is, it's to keep a consistent sleep schedule is going to be super duper important. And here's why is the, the brain, the sleep system in the brain is actually made up of two systems. One is sleep drive, which we've been talking a lot about, but the other is your circadian rhythm, which is more like your chronotype. And the more consistent you are, the more your brain actually knows when to fall asleep. Okay. So that level of consistency is incredibly important. Now, I understand it's Friday night and you don't want to go to bed at 1030 on Friday night. You want to stay up with your friends or hang out, party, what have you. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, but you need to wake up Saturday at almost the same time that you normally do during the week, at least within a half an hour. And okay. here's why is the wake up time is what resets your circadian rhythm every morning because that sunlight comes in and stops that melatonin production. Mm -hmm. So if you normally wake up at let's say 6.30 and you stayed up until 1.30, I still want you to wake up around 6.30, 7 o'clock. Take no naps throughout the day if you can help it and then go to bed at your normal bedtime because that way you'll have a little bit of sleep deprivation which will put you to sleep very quickly and it'll bring you into sleep very quickly. The biggest mistake that a lot of my patients make is they get up at the same time, like let's say on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, but then they want to get in bed early on Saturday night or on Sunday night because of the sleep that they've missed and they want to catch up okay. on their sleep. Sleep doesn't really work that way. That's not how sleep works. It's it, Sleep is a lot like a baseball game, right? So if the game is going to start at eight o'clock, if you show up an hour and a half late to the game, the game doesn't start over, right? The game right. started at eight o'clock. And so, you know, if you show up in the third inning, you, you missed something. And that's a lot of times a very particular kind of sleep called stage three and four sleep or delta sleep. And that's the physically restorative sleep. That's what's in the beginning of the sleep. At the end of your sleep is actually REM sleep, a lot more REM sleep than anywhere else. Right. And that's again, the mentally restorative sleep. And so if you go to bed early, it's like going to batting practice. You might see a little bit, but you're not going to see anything really worthy of a game, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you follow, if you go to bed, let's say two hours earlier because you missed two hours the night before, yeah, sure, you may fall asleep, coast in and out of it, but your your brain doesn't want to go to bed until bedtime, and that's really when you're going to start to see some of that sleep coming back for you. Okay, and so during the later phases, or I guess the, the later cycles of uh, an eight-hour sleep period, say. The REM period is longer, right? That's correct. So okay. it's short in the beginning of the night, long in the last third. But the opposite is true of stage three, four delta sleep, which is big during the first third of the night and gets less and less as you progress throughout the evening. Gotcha. And I think that's actually a perfect time to ask you about something I get asked about a lot. Sure. And I think this actually illustrates why it doesn't work. But I'd love to know your thoughts about polyphasic sleep. Sure. So... I have lots of people who come up to me and they ask me to create polyphasic sleep schedules for them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss did an, a de decent job of it in his book, The 4-Hour Body. And there was, all, for on the internet, there was a guy, I think his name was Uberman, and yeah. he had created some polyphasic sleep schedules. Pros and cons, okay? So number one, if you're trying to squeeze, you know, your amount of sleep in a smaller amount of time, good luck to you. But here's what I found happened with several of my patients who tried to follow these schedules. So number one, it's incredibly lonely. You're up mm. at times when nobody you know is awake. Okay. Mm. And you know, I don't care how many friends you have on the other side of the world that you're going to Skype with on the internet. You're going to run out of friends, you know, pretty quickly at three o'clock in the morning when all of your friends are asleep and you are wide awake. Yeah. Number two, if you have any proclivity for depression, it will come out. 
because you really are depriving your body of a full sleep cycle. Even though you're able to fudge it and get away with it mm -hmm. um, for a certain period of time, it will absolutely bring about depression. If you have bipolar, it will absolutely bring out a manic episode. So you have to be super duper careful. The third thing is people end up getting kind of socially inept with it. Like you have to go to sleep at very particular times. You cannot deviate at all from the schedule. Yeah. And so like you can't go to dinner and a movie like you don't have enough time in between naps to do mm -hmm. it. So I, I know people who do it and they, some people like it, but very few people have I ever seen stick with it. I tried it during my sophomore year of college and uh, no depression, but I felt like a zombie basically. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, it's like. Oh, sorry, guys, I can't go to that thing because my nap is coming up in 40 minutes and right. uh, it, it must be at this time. And yeah, that's just exactly. terrible. But I mean, it just, just it doesn't logically make sense to me because <laughs> you know, know. Your, your final cycle of sleep, you should be in REM for longer than 20 minutes. So, yeah, exactly. You know, you're not even getting enough REM if you're doing it that way. Yeah, I, I, it's not my favorite thing, you know, and, and I usually try to talk people out of it if at mm -hmm. all possible. And most of the time I can talk people out of it, but there are plenty of times where people are like, no, I got to do it. So, you know, <laughs> I, I need more hours luck. in the day. Right. What about the the less crazy? I mean, Uberman is kind of like way out there at the end. But what about just like I know people take the siesta concept a little bit further and they'll sleep for mm -hmm. two, three hours during the afternoon and then do sure. maybe five hours at night. Does that work? Mm -hmm. It can. And some people can do it actually quite well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything absolutely positively wrong with it? No, there's not. You know, that's more biphasic sleeping than polyphasic sleeping, right? So you've got mm. two distinct sleep periods. And I don't necessarily have a big problem with it. if you want to sleep five hours at night and three hours during the day. If you can work it into your social schedule, go for it. Interesting. OK, that might have to change my uh, upcoming sleep videos. <laughs> so I'm curious to know about some times of the day which you should do certain things. Sure. For one, I have heard that it is better to exercise in the morning than it is at night because exercise raises your core body temp and then it takes a long time to bring it down to the level at which sleep is easy. Is that mm -hmm. the case? No. No. So okay. here's how it works. Okay. And so there's a lot of myths surrounding exercise and when should you exercise? So first of all, you're a lion. Mm -hmm. And so actually it's, your body temperature isn't warm enough for you to exercise in the morning. You would be the person that would have the greatest likelihood of being able to exercise in the morning because you get up earlier mm -hmm. than most people. And so you have to give your body enough time to actually reach a core body temperature where it gets warm to avoid muscle strain, injury, things like that. So num that's kind of number one. Lions, if they're if anybody's going to exercise early in the morning, it's going to be lions. But I actually like lions to use to change their time of exercise to the evenings. And here's why. It's because that's when they're the sleepiest and exercise will give them energy more times than not. Okay. Um, and so by exercising at like 5.30, 6 o'clock, it'll actually allow you to stay up and you'll probably be able to stay up until 9, 30, 10, maybe even 11 and feel a lot better. Now you have a tendency, it sounds like, to want to go to bed earlier, but you also wake up still pretty. You don't go to bed that early though, right? I, I start getting real sleep. sleepy at like 11. Right. So, so not super early. Right. So what we could do, if you did your exercise at like, say, 530, mm -hmm. you would be able to stay up till midnight. No problem. Now, I'm not saying you can't stay up till midnight and like forcing yourself, but you could genuinely be able to do that. And using exercise as a as a lever point, you could actually do it that way. Um, the other hmm. thing that people can use exercise for is, is an appetite depressant. So if okay. people are out there trying to lose weight, one of the easiest things you can do is have a moderate amount of exercise in the evenings, because right after you work out, you're not hungry. And that's another way to kind of work through that area if, if you're looking to it. It also depends on the type of exercise and what you're trying to accomplish, right? So we know that if you're like strength training, it's going to be different than if you're running. Yeah. And so trying to understand those two different types of exercises, that's when you need to kind of look at the different circadian rhythms that you have going on and, and what, again, you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Well, I'd actually like to dig into that because I do sure. strength train, run and figure skating which are all very different. Okay. And one yeah. of them is on a giant cold rink. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Gosh. So that's a whole different ball game. So for, so let's start with the ones that I know a lot about. Mm -hmm. So let's start with cardio, right? And so for you as a lion, you're going to, there are a couple of times that you would actually be really good at cardio training. Let me, I'm actually going to pull out my book right now. Okay. 
because it's hard to remember every single study because <laughs> I had literally 200 different studies. Oh my uh, gosh. In, in the book. So I'm going to turn to page 121 and I'm going to grab my glasses and then I'll tell you exactly for you as a lion, right? And so there's three different, so the question becomes, why are you running? Are you running to burn fat, have better or have better performance or raise the overall quality of your sleep? Which uh, one you usually it's just for athletic performance. Okay. So when, so if you're trying to run faster, right, or have better from a performance time, there's actually a performance rhythm within your body. Okay. So the, uh, there was actually a great study in 2015, a British study that showed that most, the most significant factor in, I'm, I'm reading from the book now, the most significant factor in predicting athletic peak performance across a wide range of sports is the time athletes prefer to rise relative to the time they perform. Researchers had athletes train at several times throughout the day and measured their speed and agility. Early risers, that's you, perform best late in the morning. Immediate, uh, intermediate risers did best in the afternoon and late risers did best in the evening, right? So okay. following your chronotype. So if you're a lion, you're going to do better probably around 11 o'clock to go for a run. than you are at, let's say, five o'clock in the afternoon, unless right. you're trying to, again, extend that time of yours in the evening so that you can stay up a little bit later. But that's purely if you're trying to do performance. Yeah. If you're trying to do, let's say, burn fat, then you want to you're going to want to think about running at a little bit different time. So as a lion, I've got you down here, 5.30 p.m. is gonna give you a good energy boost in the evening and may increase some of your performance or running at 11 o'clock is gonna increase your performance. Okay. Definitely. So if I've Whereas, got mm -hmm, a competition go come up or something, it would be best if I was going on at 11, pretty much. Exactly. Okay. Well, and the other thing is letting your body know when it's gonna exercise every day is gonna be important too because that consistency factor has a tendency to work really well. Mm -hmm. Me being a wolf, it's actually better for me to exercise in the evenings because I'm I'm awake then. Okay. So I noticed you didn't, I don't think you said that anyone should exercise early in the morning. So is it basically across the board, people are better off exercising at least a couple of hours after they wake up? Yeah, I rarely want people to exercise before about 7.30 in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. One of the worst times that you could go for a run, as an example, is like at 6 a.m. Um, really? Okay. So, yeah. Well, core body temperature is low mm -hmm. and muscles and joints are very susceptible to like strain or tears or things like that. If you can at least wait 90 minutes after you wake up, your temperature is going to be higher and your risk of injury drops significantly. Okay. Yeah. The, the problem with skating in particular is the practice sessions are always very early. Right. So well, I tend to have to start time. at seven. Mm -hmm. So, but I wake up at five 30, so I do at least get 90 yeah. minutes before I get on the ice and I do a lot mm -hmm. of warm ups and stuff too. Yeah, it's key. It's going to be super key for you to be stretching, especially since you're in a cold environment. Mm -hmm. You're really going to want to have like good, like good long underwear on, like ha make sure that your body is nice and warm before you hit the ice, because otherwise just the environment that you're in is going to be is going to make you very susceptible to strain or tear. OK, so what about caffeine? I mean, this is <laughs> this is like the fuel of all students. <laughs> it is. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Mm hmm. So let's talk about caffeine. Mm. So first of all, one of the when you wake up in the morning, you're dehydrated. Most people don't know, but you actually breathe out approximately one liter of water while you're asleep at night. Really? And so the first thing you should do, yeah, one thing, the first things that you should do is not drink a cup of coffee, which by the way is a diuretic and can make you even more dehydrated. Okay. One of the things that you should do is reach over and get a room temperature glass of water and chug it, mm -hmm. right? Literally right as you're, sitting on the edge of your bed, you should have water right next to you. Go ahead and drink a full glass of water. Okay. Because what you'll find is that you'll actually rehydrate yourself and you should do it standing in front of a window getting direct sunlight. Do me a favor, put on a robe or pajamas before you stand in front of a window <laughs> getting direct sunlight. But that's the best way to wake up. Then waiting approximately 90 to 120 minutes is actually going to be really good for you. And here's the reason why. When you wake up, you're actually waking up due to the fact that a uh, level of adrenaline has increased and cortisol has increased. Mm -hmm. If you look at cortisol and adrenaline compared to caffeine, they're like, I think it's like five or seven times more powerful than caffeine. So by adding caffeine is the first thing that you drink in the morning, it's not gonna do you any good other than it's just gonna make you feel jittery, 
right? And, and you're gonna have to have more of it to have any sort of an effect because you've already over, you're already stimulated in the morning enough to wake up your body from an unconscious state. Okay. Better that you wait 90 to 120 minutes when both the adrenaline and the cortisol begins to drop mm -hmm. and then you can pick your energy level back up from there. So it'd be better off for me to drink my water in the morning, which I do, mm -hmm. and then wait a bit, go exercise, and then go yep. get my Starbucks after that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. If that you try maybe... that, if you try that exact routine, but meanwhile, getting sunlight in the morning as well, mm -hmm. I'd love to then come back to you and see what happens because I bet you your workouts will work out, will go much better. Okay. Well, I will change my little habit structure around and start that tomorrow morning. There you go. As I can. That's cool. Is there a time of the day where caffeine should stop being ingested? Well, here's the thing is it depends upon your level of sensitivity to caffeine. Mm -hmm. I've got patients who have different levels of sensitivity across the board. But generally, as a general recommendation, I'm usually telling people somewhere between two and three o'clock is probably the best time for you to go decaf or, or zero calf if you possibly can. Okay. And here's here's why is the average half life of caffeine is somewhere between six and eight hours, depending upon how quickly of a metabolizer you are. So what we don't want is that caffeine affecting your ability to fall asleep at night. You know, you gotta remember, I deal with people who have sleep problems and so almost everybody walking through the door is probably not gonna be a great candidate for using caffeine in the later evening because it will affect their sleep. Right. But I, you know, I have people come up to me all the time and they're like, oh, Dr. Bruce, I can drink a, you know, a double espresso after dinner and fall right asleep. So my answer is, I bet you can. That's either one, you're so damn sleep deprived that you're just <laughs> sleeping through those caffeine, the, the stimulating effects of caffeine. Or if I slap some EEG electrodes on your brain while you're sleeping, I guarantee you, you're not getting good deep sleep because mm -hmm. the caffeine is preventing you from getting there. So they're just stuck in like stage three all night or something, you know? Oh, I wish they wish they were in stage three. They're in stage one or two. Ooh, okay. So that, that's like, barely sleep. Exactly. That's like the light crappy stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I should probably not drink coffee near bed either. Yeah. <laughs> this is like prescription for changing my entire daily routine. Okay, so so this is so this is interesting, right? And so a lot of people tell me that they're like, "Oh my gosh, you want me to change everything?" So the answer is no. I don't want you to change everything. Mm -hmm. I want you to pick one or two things, just one or two, and change the timing of when you do them. Notice I didn't tell you not to have caffeine. I didn't tell you not to exercise. Yeah, I'm just telling you just change the times of it. And I only want people to change one or two things at a time. Mm -hmm. It would be impossible to try and change your entire life because it just isn't going to work that well. Yeah. You yeah, know? I definitely know that. That that's one of the kind of the biggest hallmarks of any kind of video or podcast I make is just one little thing because right. I've tried doing entire life changing routines before. It's it lasts about 2 hours. Yeah. Give or take. So the last questions I had with respect to timing were, is there a generally accepted best time for high brain power, super creative work, and then low brain power work? And is that really specific to your chronotype or are there kind of some general? Okay. It absolutely is. So like as an example, there's a section in my book where it's all about when should you make a decision? Mm-hmm. Okay, because that's something that's pretty important to brain power, like think through a lot of different things, kind of try to figure it all out. And so here's where it gets really interesting, right? And so you're a lion, correct? Right. So you're on times or your peak times to learn something new or to make a decision are between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then after somewhere between 2 or 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. So you've got a lag right in the middle of the day, which actually you talked about earlier in the podcast, right? You said you're worthless between one and three, right? Yep, pretty much. Right. And so then if you look at a bear, we would rotate that a little bit later. So bears are good between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. And then again from 3 p.m. to 11. And then wolves are good from 12 to 2 and then 5 to 1 a.m. Right. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're kind of moving through the clock. Mm -hmm. across the day. And what you're finding is, is that those time periods are very, very important. So if you wake up at six, you're going to be, you know, once you kind of clear the morning fog and get ready, you're going to be good till probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And then you're going to start to stall out from an analytical standpoint, right? Where you have to take a lot of pieces of information, analyze them and make a decision from it. Yeah. But that actually is also a, a that time where you're slowing down from the analytics is actually a great time for what I call groggy greatness. Okay. And this is where you're a little distracted, you're a little tired. This is a great time to brainstorm new ideas, try to problem solve, just try to come up with very interesting out of the box thinking 
that's going to be happening more when you're tired. And for you, that's probably going to fall into that maybe one to three category. Interesting. So you're a wolf. So your times are a little bit different. They are. They're later how, uh, than yours. How strict are you with scheduling your day? How do you make decisions? Are, are you actually like blocking out time in your calendar to say, this is my groggy greatness time? It or is. is yeah. It, oh, okay. Absolutely. So like, you know, writing a book takes couple of different skills, right? So you have to read research, especially a nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. You have to read research and analyze the research. Then you have to kind of brainstorm about where in the book would that go and what would I say about it? And then you have to actually write it, right? And so those are three very different skill sets. And so when I was reading research, I would go in my peak alert hours. But, you know, for me, my peak alert hours, because I'm a wolf, would be, you know, between like noon and two. Right. And so yeah. what am I doing for the rest of that morning? Well, in the morning, if I'm waking up, let's say at eight, then I would kind of get my day started. And then I might use exercise in the earlier part of the day. Again, not at 6 a.m., but in the earlier part of the day, like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I use that to calm me down, like get me going and kind of focus me. And then I might be able to do something analytical then, like take a piece of research, like read a piece of research and be able to kind of move it in, in the direction that I want and then be able to write a little bit about it. Then I move into more the skill set of where does it go in the book a little bit later on in the day. So I actually planned out my my calendar in very different ways where I would be doing different things at different times. And I was I was pleasantly surprised that it worked out really well. Interesting. I think it is nice to have a lot of control over your schedule so you can do that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of my work from home, but I wrote this book and it's about 300 or so pages and I wrote it in three months. Wow, nice job. Yeah. Did you yeah, have a, any sort of daily writing goal or page goal or anything like that? I really didn't. You know, it was really more about just kind of getting into the groove. And, you know, the way the book is categorized, it's done, you know, where I talk about what is a chronotype and I teach people how to identify theirs. Then I have the perfect day in the life of each chronotype. And so there's a whole chapter on, you know, if you could have a perfect day as a lion or a perfect day as a wolf, what would that look like? And then I went into 50 different activities. And so I knew kind of where my natural cutoff points would be. And those would be my writing goals. Interesting. And is mm -hmm. this the best time of the day for you to do interviews? Um, four o'clock in the afternoon because I'm on Pacific time. This isn't like a terrible time for me. Mm -hmm. I'm actually about ready to kind of hit my alert time. This is kind of my groggy greatness where I can kind of think about things in a different way. So actually, yeah, I would say for podcasting, this is actually probably a great time for me to be interviewed. I know you've been on uh, several different TV shows and they're usually morning <laughs> shows. Are those not good for they're you then? They're brutal. <laughs> they are brutal. The good news is some of them tape in the afternoon, but they're, re, you know, they're replayed earlier in the morning. But okay. I mean, there are definitely times where I am just dragging because it's like, this is not, I am not a morning person. You know, why am I here at, you know, 530? <laughs> <laughs> I've done one television show. Luckily it was, I think it was late afternoon. So I didn't have to mm. get up too early for it, but yeah. I guess I would have been fine with early morning. Well, what's interesting is a lot of times I'm actually traveling from the West Coast to the East Coast. So mm -hmm. I'm even more messed up because I'm jet lagged. Oh, yeah. Right. So if, I'll see here. If, how does wh which one's worse going to the East Coast or coming back? Yeah. East is least and West is best. Okay. So it's easier to travel West because you're just asking your body to stay up later. It's harder mm -hmm. to travel East because you're asking your body to go to bed earlier. So oh, yeah. you end up getting much more jet lag when you're traveling in an eastward direction than if you're traveling west. Okay. I think the, the only time I've ever had horrible, horrible jet lag was when I went to Japan. But it, it might have been worse when I came back. I'm not sure. Yeah. Everybody always says that they're like, it wasn't so bad going, but coming back is brutal. Yeah. And that's because of the direction of travel usually. Well, the time we went, uh, we landed so late that mm -hmm. and we couldn't speak the language, so we couldn't find a hotel. So mm. we just decided to stay up the entire night and we were <laughs> awake for probably about 40 hours. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a jet lag for some different reasons. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I personally, I can't go much more than anything less than about six hours of sleep before I'm just like, I'm not going to be any good to anybody. Mm. And I did read a study recently that was saying six, uh, six hours of sleep, you know, can be fine on, you know, for one day or something. But if you keep doing six hours of sleep consecutively, it really starts to wear you down. I'm not sure where I found that study, but I have noticed that for myself 
if I only do six hours for several days in a row, I start to get pretty sleep deprived. Yeah. So I think for me, at least six hours is not uh, uh, enough for me. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've been a six and a half to seven hour sleeper almost my whole life. So mm-hmm. eight hours is a myth for those of you out there. Really between seven and nine seems to be the best recommendations as we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, if you want to cheat yourself on sleep, go for it. But you're going to pay for it in the end. Like, you know, you, you can't fool Mother Nature. You know, yeah. your body needs what your body needs. And if you wake yourself up during the deepest part of a sleep cycle, that's actually bad, right? Yeah, you don't want to because what happens is once you wake up, you have to go through a very particular dance move in order to get back there. Mm-hmm. So the, the way it works is you go from wake to stage one to stage two down to stage three and four, which is the growth hormone, deep, refreshing, physically restorative sleep, back up to stage two and on into REM. And that's considered a cycle. If you wake up during stage three, four sleep, you have to start back at stage one and stage two. Oh, okay. So you're just missing an entire yep. REM cycle if you do that. Possibly. Yeah. In that particular scenario, absolutely. Yeah. You miss an entire REM cycle. Interesting. So last kind of question or maybe a couple questions here. A lot of people have asked me, hey, I wake up in the middle of the night. How do I get back okay. to sleep or what do I do? So what's the solution for that? Sure. So the first thing is, you know, kind of trying to understand the reasons why people wake up. So first of all, everybody wakes up multiple times at night. Sometimes you remember it, sometimes you don't, but everybody wakes up a couple of times a night. So don't be alarmed if that's what's going on with you because mm-hmm. it's really not that big of a deal. Okay. Um, it On average, it takes the average person about 15 to 20 minutes to fall back asleep. So again, don't be concerned if it's taking you a little while to fall back asleep, especially if you, for example, went into the bathroom and turned on the lights because you just told your brain it was morning and it got all that blue light and it stops that melatonin production. So it makes it very difficult to fall back asleep. Okay. Um, if you don't have to go to the bathroom, don't go. Just because you're awake doesn't mean you need to go to the restroom. Mm-hmm. Um, If you wake up and you notice that you're uncomfortable or in pain or it's too hot or something like that, you know, go ahead and resituate yourself and then just calmly relax yourself. If you can avoid actually sitting up and getting out of bed, you're going to be in a better spot. Um, Mm. And don't worry so much. You know, that's the other thing that people get is they, they look at the clock and they instantly do the mental math. Right. They instantly yeah. say, OK, it's three thirty. I got to get up at six thirty. I got three hours left of sleep. Oh, crap. Tomorrow's going to stink. You know, what am I going to do? And they start worrying through that. Mm-hmm. The very last thing that you need in the middle of the night is your clock. OK, okay. when the sun comes up, that's when you're going to get up. So don't look at the clock. Try not to get out of bed unless you need to and just chill out and relax. You'll be surprised at how quickly you'll be able to fall back asleep. The other thing is, is don't try to um, think about what am I doing tomorrow? What am I gonna do the next day? What happened today? Don't start actively using your mind because what will happen is you'll get stuck into some emotional situation like, oh, I'm worried about my son at school or you know, I'm worried about a teacher in class or I'm worried about my girlfriend or my boyfriend or what have you. And that just kind of starts the train rolling. And once the train has left the station on those, it's really hard to get it back. Great dis- distraction technique that I personally use and I use with my patients is I have them count backwards from 300 by threes. Okay. So think about it for a second. 300. I'm in my head right now. 297. Uh huh. 294. 291. 288. Right. You can't right. think it's mathematically so complicated. You can't think of anything else, and it's so doggone boring. You're out like a light. <laughs> okay. It really works. It is more complicated than sheep much. <laughs> uh, and I had heard that it, it's a good idea to not be able to see your clock from your bed, which is what Absolutely. my girlfriend and I do. We face it away from the bed. So you have to actually sit up to look at it. And I think that helps. I usually don't have problems waking up in the middle of the night, at least not that I know of. I've been told by roommates in the past that I have said some weird things to them, but <laughs> <laughs> luckily I don't remember them. So that's funny. Uh, cool. And then if somebody's in that situation where they they are awake, they are worried and they've already gotten up to go to the bathroom or something, I've heard that you're supposed to leave your bed, but I'm not sure. Is that true? Say that part again. I've heard that like, if you you just cannot get back to sleep, you're already worrying, you're already, you've already gone to the bathroom or something that it's a better idea to leave your bedroom and go do something until you're tired again. That is absolutely true. Okay. 
So if I it's would just recommend like, that. Can't get better if sleep. You're, if, yeah, if you're up for 30 minutes and you're just tossing and turning, you're just getting pissed off. You might as well just get up at that point. Mm-hmm. And and get up with the intent to stay up or get up until you feel it tired. It depends on how close you are to waking up. If you're within two hours of having to get up for the day, then just go ahead and get up for the day. If you're not, if you could get like a good three hour chunk, get up and do something very relaxing, whether it's reading a book, using a, a, a nightlight or, um, you know, I prefer it if you don't watch TV, but for some people watching TV helps put them back to sleep. So just click on the TV timer, watch some TV, fall back asleep. Mm-hmm. You don't want to do things like clean the house, look for this, look for that, you know, wandering all over the place. You don't want to do anything that causes a lot of autonomic arousal because that could be a problem. Right. And for TV and other kinds of things like that, do you think it's useful to use apps like Flux that kind of damp down that blue light exposure? I do. I use Flux on all of my computers and I use Night Shift on my phone and I like it. I think okay. it works well. Yeah, I was pretty stoked when they released that on the iPhone because you can yeah. never get flux in the iPhone. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and I mean, quite honestly, there was a healthcare problem there, right? Like mm. they created a health issue. And so you got to fix the health issue. Yeah. Cool. Well, this has been really, really informative. And I think the listeners are really going to enjoy this episode because I've been getting tons of sleep questions. And I think it's going <laughs> to help a lot with uh, with my next video on sleep as well. So thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to finishing reading your book, and then I will have a link to the book in the show notes, which if you're listening to this on release day, it'll be out tomorrow. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. And if you want to check out the power of when quiz dot com, you can figure out your chronotype and maybe change your life. Yeah. And if people want to connect with you or follow you online, is there uh, Twitter or any kind of online accounts you have? Absolutely. So I'm on Facebook at The Sleep Doctor and I'm on Twitter at The Sleep Doctor. And I also have I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram. Sounds good. All right. Well, I'll have all those links up in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that about does it for this episode of the podcast. Hopefully you found this interview informative and hopefully it helped you in some way. Once again, you can find the show notes for this episode with lots of resource links and further reading over at CIGpodcast.com and find that episode 124 link on that page. If you want to find my favorite resources and apps and tools and other gear for making your college experience a better one, you can go over to collegeinfogeek.com slash resources and check out our newly redesigned resource page there, which also has a college packing guide and a list of my favorite books that you might find useful as well. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you in next week's episode. Until then, stay cute.